Thank you for joining us for the third day and the last day of our annual meeting. Uh, today we have uh, three very exciting sessions lined up. Um, today is the third day and the last day of our concluding annual meeting. Uh, first, we will have a panel discussion uh, and a presentation entitled From Research to Policy, Insights from the Care Work and the Economy Project. And the session will be chaired by Professor Diane Elson, Professor Emerita at University of Essex. The presentation will be given by the Care Work and the Economy Project's co-principal investigator, Dr. Elizabeth King. Following that, we will hear from <clears throat> the funders of care research and advocacy, uh, including from Marina Durano, a senior program officer of the Women's Rights Program at Open Society Foundations, as well as Altea Anderson, Program Officer of Global Development and Population at the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation. And the last session of today uh, will be a short panel discussion chaired by uh, Elizabeth King and uh, entitled, What's Next? New Research on Care and the Economy. On that panel, we'll have Ito Peng, Isabella Abordarain, Ana Maria Tribbin, and Maria Floro. So without further ado, I'll pass the mic over to uh, Professor Diane Elson. Uh, great to be with you all. I'm sorry that I wasn't able to join yesterday or the day before. I've been uh, away for a few days. So I'm really looking forward to this session because I think this is this is uh, the culmination of, a, of the intellectual work that's been done, um, which is really important. But we'd also like to think about how this intellectual work can have an impact on policy. So I'm really pleased that we've got Beth uh, to start us off um, with some key points for this discussion. And then I think after Beth's spoken for about 15 minutes, we're going to go into three breakout groups for 20 minutes. And then there'll be a report back from each of those breakout groups, each report back about 15 minutes. And then we'll have about 20 minutes general discussion. Anybody who wants to make a point, uh, wants to ask a question, uh, can feel free to, to, do, uh, to do that. So uh, let me now hand over uh, to Beth, who needs no introduction to you all, um, to give a brief presentation, pulling out some of the key points for policy. Thank you very much, Diane, and hope, hopefully I'm not muted. Um, it's a tall order to summarize the policy insights from such a rich research project. I mean, we have more than 30 papers and then blogs and the conversations. So I think, and, and the, the, the discussions over the past two days have also been a lot about um, policy implications and insights we were getting. So I've come up with a simple schema to try and summarize um, this huge uh, body of, of lessons. So the first thing I wanna show you is that really our project has been about caring for all. And that's not something we talk about a lot, the care for all, it sounds like a slogan, but it is in fact a, a, a recognition that we all need care and we all give care. And so talking about caring for all from cradle to grave, is, I think is a, is a really apt description of, uh, of the topic of this, of the research topic of the project. And in particular, demographic transitions and uh, the hypertility in poor countries, the COVID uh, pandemic, has really um, emphasized that the care burden in families is not equally shared. That, and this graph shows us the percent change in labor force participation since January, 2020, and then reflecting uh, what happened to labor force participation of men and women with and without kids um, over the 
past year. And what we can see here is that really it's everybody suffered at the beginning of the pandemic, but then it, uh, women with young kids have uh, sustained these losses and uh, labor force participation. So that's just kind of a, a little nugget about what we see as the as the cost, as the toll of caregiving to caregivers. And then we know also from the various research, and in this case, I'm, I'm, I'm mentioning research with um, colleagues here about the care need in 2030, and that we would need if we could if we could actually uh, compare the care need that's unpaid to the care to the paid paid labor force, it would be one third to two fifths, one fifth to two fifths of the paid labor force. And in terms of equivalence with GDP, well, that's about 16 to 32 uh, percent of the GDP in three of the countries that this study focused on. What did the CARE project do? We, as we uh, heard over the past couple of days, was a survey in Korea, which was used to understand better uh, the cost of care bearing care uh, giving in the family. Uh, we have studies that have used time use surveys and combined those data with household survey data in order to understand intra-household allocation of caregiving. And also uh, we heard yesterday from, from Gretchen and BK uh, about pol policy stimulations when you're looking at future demographic, demographic change. We also heard heard yesterday from we listened to um, Mar Martin give uh, the summary of his work with Hans and others about the CGE in, uh, in South Korea. And what we saw was the importance of having these kinds of models in order to understand the relationship between caregiving, which is usually thought to be in the realm of the family and the link between that and the and the macro econ uh, economy. So back to the schema. So some of the what I want to show here are we have a care economy, which means we have actors, economic actors. So what I show here are four different groups of actors. So here is uh, what we have in the project uh, done about individuals families and communities. And these are a list of the papers that, that have been done in the project. The lessons from this or the, the, the insight from this, one, we spent a lot of time understanding the burden of family care, who cares and who shares. We've done work on forecasting the future demand of care, as I mentioned with, with Gretchen, but also with, with Hannah and, and Sue and myself. And then we try to understand the toll and the reward and the quality of life of caregivers. That's work that we've done uh, with, with, uh, with G1 and made possible because we have the CTMS database. We've also looked, many of us have looked at the role of social and gender norms relative to market incentives and policies. And we've also tried to understand just how, what, what is the family's access to affordable, good quality paid caregiving? Although I think in general, this, this is a, 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 a point that we could still, we could have done more work on. Paid care service workers, we heard a lot about that, um, but this is actually something, uh, an area that we could do more work on. What we have seen are uh, we we saw the the paper on oh, this was not presented in this uh, in this annual meeting but there was a workshop that Charlotte Fryer had done on this uh, using a special social network analysis of the paid paid care workers in Korea and how how they advocate for themselves but also really understanding the kinds of constraints that they face in getting together in. In, in making sure that they are recognized, making sure that they are paid appropriately, et cetera, et cetera. So what we wanna do is to be able to encourage use of, of paid caregiving, but we need to be able to do that. We need to think about promoting the quality of caregiving. And that means building trust in the quality of paid caregiving. 
that's something that uh, that Martin actually yesterday talked a little bit about is that families understand that family caregiving is not necessarily this it's not exactly the same there's no perfect substitution with family caregiving and and, and paid caregiving but I think one of the things that the, one of the reasons for that is that the quality assurance mechanisms could be missing. There's no enough, not enough training for paid caregivers. And then there's not enough trust in the quality of the caregiver, caregiving. We also need to think about, as I said, the rights of care workers. A third group is the private sector employers. And this one is something that we did not do a whole lot on, but yesterday we heard from ML about her work with with uh, with uh, uh, EPEC, and uh, so this was the work that was done on the on the private sector employers. But very important, what do we need? We need to think about direct care services from the employers, uh, employers to give more generous, appropriate work benefits, such as maternity or family leave, sick leave, a health insurance plan, pension plan, and reasonable, reasonable and flexible work hours. Again, some, that's something that ML and EPEX work did was to show how in Korea in particular, you have you know, six to eight hours of work per week. There's no time for anything else after 62 there's no time for anything else, no time for caring or even self-care. And we need to think also about much larger uh, issue, which is non-discriminatory recruitment and promotion practices that need to be care sensitive, as in hiring people means people have those care needs. I'm going fast because I don't have a whole lot of time. And the fourth and very important actor in this care economy is the government at different levels. And I can't get to this. Sorry. I have, okay, there you go. And with the national, with the government. So these are the various papers that have been done. And I'm sorry if I've sort of missed out, missed point uh, category, putting uh, some of your work uh, in this slide. I tried to be as as um, comprehensive as possible, but may not have achieved that. And we want a lot from government. One thing is the social care infrastructure and what that means. And here are at least some of the things we've talked about, regulatory policies for quality assurance, information about care policies and services, and making sure that caregivers, both paid and unpaid, have proper information about, or adequate information about good quality caregiving. This is something that I don't think we've, we've said much in our, in our project. Direct care services, the government can provide public early childhood development services and robust and equitable health insurance. Again, this is not so much something that we've, we've talked about and needs more work on. And finally, something that several papers in the past few days have called for is more research in medical and social science. Now the government also has the role uh, of, of expanding the care economy. And how can it do that? Tax incentives for families, labor regulations, making sure that people don't work, you know, huge unreasonable number of hours so that they can care for themselves and their families. Immigration policy, something that was missing, I think, from the work that we've done so far. But really, when you think about it, immigration policy is important in several countries because the migrants, immigrants, are a very important part of the care, uh, paid care, caregiving sector. So in summary, we just summarizing those various insights. So the paid care sector workers, what they can give to individuals and families and communities, what the private sector employers can guarantee for individuals, families and communities, how the government can relate to paid care service sectors, what the government should be doing to make sure that the employers are also responsible for tax, for, for caregiving using 
legislation, tax incentives, information, that the government itself has this responsibility also to individuals, of course, through either direct services and a comprehensive care agenda. And lastly, individuals, families, and communities are not only receivers, they have the responsibility to pay taxes and to vote for pro-care officials. I mean, the, this is a care economy that has co-responsibilities and accountabilities. And that is something that we want to, our project wants to, to the mess, a big message out there is that the care economy is really also a political economy. So these are political, we are all receivers, but we are political actors working in a market and in a, in a, political, a political arena. I probably went through that very quickly, but I wanted to make sure that I got all of those in and also to give the breakout session enough time. And these are uh, the, the questions that we hope uh, you, can, you will have, help us think about and that we can discuss. And I'm gonna leave that there so everybody can see it. Diane, back to you. Thank, thank you, thank you, Beth. That was very helpful. And I really like the diagram. I think you know that there was a dynamic diagram that really uh, helped us to think through these interconnections and areas for policy uh, to play a role. And I think now it's uh, the breakout time. We've got these um, questions to consider, and I think that you're all going to be allocated uh, to breakout sessions. So I'll hand over, is it Shirin who's doing this? I'll hand over uh, to whoever's doing this. Thank you, Diane, and thank you, Beth. Um, we will now be opening up the breakout rooms and assigning people. So you should get a message soon about which, which group or which breakout room you're assigned to. And you can click join and uh, be taken to that room. I hope you all had some good discussions, too short a time, I'm sure. Uh, but uh, we have to do the best we can with the time we've got. Um, and we're gonna have report backs from the three groups now. Um, so um, maybe, uh, I think it's um, Ito, uh, Beth and Sue, is that right? So Ito, do you want to go first? Sure, thank you very much. Um, we had a very active uh, discussion, in fact, so active that in the middle of it, we get thrown back to the main room. Uh, we talked a lot about um, sort of um, in terms of what priority should a national care agenda have. Uh, many, uh, we discussed about child care as a key budget agenda in Canada, but also as a potential uh, uh, area for investing in care infrastructure uh, that would help grow the economy. Um, that, 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 that child care uh, infrastructure, uh, investing in child care infrastructure is gaining more momentum because of the COVID uh, crisis. Um, if there's a priority to be given uh, to government, uh, child care should be one of them. Um, Although uh, some people have also mentioned that the long-term care is just uh, it should, should also be given uh, priority. Uh, um, I'm, I'm just reading out the notes um, that Catherine has written for us. Um, as a time, uh, so so um, uh, if there's a priority to give in to government, childcare is a main one. COVID was very difficult for European countries. As time went by, actually, during the crisis, men started to revert back uh, to taking a smaller role in the family care responsibility. And this is an incre increased reasons to invest in childcare. And by childcare, it's like formal 
outsourcing of the childcare, not the sort of uh, uh, private informal childcare. Um, dual approach to investing in care infrastructure uh, in both childcare and long-term care, uh, providing increased access to ensure quality, quality work um, uh, condition, quality working conditions and wages for workers would be really, really important and a, and a bit of challenge. Uh, there was discussions about the emphasis on, again, quality of care, not just the amount of care. Uh, uh, the, and family care givers uh, do not want to give up their role uh, for a paid care work, uh, paid care work uh, that they do uh, that they, that they do not have faith in. Um, I, uh, there were also conversations about uh, com combina combining, this is coming particularly from lower middle income country perspective. In one approach, a strategy might be to combine childcare with early child education as a package uh, of, for the investing in children. Um, and the, the, um, and spending because spending is available for this and and is seen as part of child education rather than parents shirking responsibility uh, then then it could be stronger opportunity what are some of the obstacles uh korean government for example uh has done a lot because of the demographic crisis um that but they and they have invested a lot uh, in care policies but they uh sort of uh, they they have pretty well max its capacity, fiscal capacity uh, in dealing with care economy. And that, 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 that we need to really push more on the private sector, employers and other actors uh, to uh, sort of, to push, uh, to uh, really um, push this agenda of investing in care economy. Uh, I'll stop there and uh, because, uh, and and have other people report. Thank you, Ito. Very interested in your last point about um, push getting the private sector to do more, pushing for the private sector to do more of the investment. I'll be interested to see if the other groups came up with a similar idea, whether they disagree with that idea. So uh, next, uh, can we have the report from, uh, from Sue? Sure. Um, so we talked about uh, building a bigger coalition, um, not just the childcare and elder care, but including healthcare. So we have to have a bigger coalition uh, between all sectors of that touch on uh, care. Um, and then we talked about the national care agenda, but um, there were some, uh, there was some concerns about um, that countries, there are many countries that don't have, who, which don't have a national care agenda. And among those who have a care agenda, national care agenda, many services are still provided uh, privately run by the government, but um, the practice is actually done at the private level. So there is a big gap in between, um, between and people, the public um, prefer the, the services done by the private sector. So like privately run facilities, people want to get services from theirs, but not from the privately owned businesses or privately owned um, services. So, and those who are in the, um, in those, even at the, even for countries, for example, Korea has, uh, which has the national care agenda, national care system. However, the, um, still the, the quality of a care workers in, in that national care agenda is just still very poor. So we need to work on that. And uh, we also talked about a private sector. We try to talk more about a public sector, um, but we understand that all hands are 
on deck. So every, um, you know, what Beth has talked about private household, uh, private sector and uh, public sector all should try to come up with a care agenda that help everybody. I think that's what we talked about. Better care job, a decent job, because of many care jobs compared to non-care jobs are uh, treated horribly. So they should get paid more and they should have a more stable job. Because so, in Japan, I think uh, there, there are many jobs that are part-time and not treated um, well. So yeah, it, which is the same to Korea as well. That it, uh, Sue? Thank you, thank you. Again, a concern with uh, the type of vision is balanced between uh, private and uh, public. Um, group three, I think it's Beth who's reporting from that. Beth, uh, over to you. I'm, I, I'm actually reporting for group one, uh, Diane. Yeah. Um, Okay, and I would say that our discussion uh, can be divided into three parts. One is directly related to COVID, that there's uh, the experience of COVID is quite different across countries. Mm -hmm. And uh, Ajit was talking about India and how the crisis is so deep in India and the necessity to act fast. Um, the care agenda is very, very important because of the losses of lot in, in life and, and, so, and the need for vaccines that are not getting to, to people. Um, but uh, at the same time, uh, he talked about the loss of livelihood and how that you've got that feedback effect between economic loss, loss of income and, and, and loss of ability to care. And so he was, he had mentioned the Mar a Marshall plan for for the global south, which I believe has, has also been discussed, I think in the, the sort of national or global uh, discourse. And this means um, uh, call, and, and also that, that means calling for the um, support from the multinationals because it's because governments may not be uh, able to, to handle the kind, the level of expenditure and the quickness of the expenditures that are needed to be able to address the, this crisis. So that's one. Second is the, uh, the pandemic has also shown the cracks in our care infrastructure. In a country in the, in, in the UK, which is a, a very good national health service, nonetheless, families do rely on on, on, on paid care workers. Um, in the US, you don't have as good a system at all as the national health system of the UK. Uh, and many developing countries don't have uh, also a, a, um, a, 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 a national health uh, insurance. So that is something that, that, that uh, needs to be, um, to be uh, addressed. We talked about a conundrum. Uh, Sergi in the beginning, I think, talked about it, or, or uh, so, someone actually talked about the care conundrum. In this case, the care conundrum that we talked about is how we need to improve the quality of paid care. And to improve the quality of paid care, we need to increase the education of care, paid care workers and the information that are available to them. At the same end, and also to make to give to make sure that they get uh, adequate pay. The conundrum is that as we do that, it also means that the families who who would like to rely on paid care may not be able to afford the paid care. And so, improving the conditions of the paid care workers is not necessarily going to uh, benefit families who cannot afford paid care. So that means to say the government has to be really active in helping families. And, and, and one point that, that Sue made, in, Sue Himmelwhite uh, uh, made in particular, is that we can't rely on the private sector to provide all of these care. I mean, just thinking about the paid uh, 
private sector to 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 develop the the care infrastructure is not going to be uh, it's not going to be it's not um, realistic and the conundrum that we were just discussing is a an example of why that that's not likely to happen and so funding is a very important part and feature of when we start discussing the care infrastructure we've also got to think about funding where the funding is going to come from how uh one one uh, one example that Sue made was actually the inheritance tax, for example, in in the UK, probably also in the US. Um, the, the kind of loopholes that uh, that very rich people, for example, um, uh, enjoy. So that so so a a, a deep crisis that has that requires acting fast, taking care of the economic losses as well, developing a care infrastructure and taking care of the cracks that have been shown, the fact that basic infrastructure um, uh, uh, parts are not even there and improving the quality of paid care in order to relieve households. And then the third was, how do we fund all of this? Thank you, Beth. Uh, thank you for uh, putting um, the question of funding quite central uh, to the policy uh, agenda. Um, uh, and I think we see that different countries are in different positions. When I looked at the, these questions, I thought you would give somewhat different answers depending on what country you're in, uh, what its fiscal capacity is, because the fiscal capacity actually can be expanded in every country if they will do more on taxation, but it's much more constrained in highly indebted countries than it is countries like Canada, the UK, the USA. So to some extent, the, 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 the answers to the questions are going to be conditioned by the particular situation of the, the country that you're in. But I think these broader political economy questions that were coming out of the report backs as well in terms of the, the balance of the, um, the public and the private sector, the profit and the not-for-profit and the public sector, uh, is a key question for policy because not only about funding, it's also about is this going to be delivered as a public service with good quality standards, training and pay and so forth, or is it going to enable the development of what we see in the UK in the care for long term care for the elderly, a kind of care capitalism in, uh, in which offshore investors own um homes for uh, frail elderly people i think those political economy questions which beth signaled in her in her diagram uh, are are also extremely important for the answers to the questions now i can see that we have got um just eight minutes left so i think i can only take something like three three comments or questions um, from uh, people. Um, uh, would people like to put in the, the people who want to speak, just indicate in the chat box, just say, I want to speak. So I can see that. Has anybody? Anybody like to make a comment before we have to close the meeting, ask a question? Ah, so I see Francesco Vecchio wants to ask a question. Uh, Francesco, go ahead. I'll be short this time. I've come to know that it's a question for everybody and it is a genuine question about things that are going on, uh, meaning that I've, I've known, for example, from Spain, uh, that there is a lot of uh, talking about private care and care capitalism. There is a lot of platform care work for the elderly, which is developing. And uh, we all know what platform uh, work may mean. So the fact that it is spreading to the care sector may have positive uh, sides, but uh, it may not in any case at this point, 
I'm simply asking a question. Is this trend also popular in other countries? If anybody knows, can you let me have a reference? Because in my own country, it's still underdeveloped. So it, it's a real question. Yeah. Thanks, uh, Francesca. It's a great question. I hope people will respond to you. And also when the group later is thinking about future research agendas, this could be something to put on future research agenda. Is there anyone else who would like to make a comment or ask a question? Oh, I, I, ah, Sergi, okay, go ahead, Sergi. Well, I think uh, one final um, comment on the challenges that mm. um, we face is also linking the issue of care with climate change. This is already upon us. And I think we need to also situate our discourse and discussing care in the context of, of climate change. Uh, I think we need to make that crucial link between the care for the environment and the care of people. And that ought to be sort of explored at some point. Thank you. Again, perhaps a question to put on the agenda for the future. I'm very struck. Uh, one last question. I see we have um, Amika Chai, a question about privatization. So yeah. if you'd like to ask a question and then this I think will be the last one we have time for. Yeah, um, well, uh, yeah, under the uh, Corona uh, virus uh, issue, I saw the limit of privatization of care in Japan. Mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, it's not efficient at all. Uh, it didn't <laughs> work uh, under this situation. Uh, so the local government regretted uh, that they uh, cut the budget for uh, pri uh, pub public uh, hospitals. So maybe we can rethink, reconsider uh, the uh, direction about privatization of care. Thank you. I think that that is certainly an issue that uh, many of us are very concerned about the way in which privatization and outsourcing has left all kinds of care services very inadequately placed to deal with the COVID crisis. On the other hand, I am, have been standing, of course, outside the USA, somewhat heartened and, and Canada to see the issue of investment in care, rising up the agenda, the politicians, the president and so forth, talking about investing in social infrastructure, articles in the New York Times, uh, uh, about uh, with, with interviews with feminist economists like uh, Nancy Fogg and uh, their work on care. So I also, I don't know whether everybody shares this, also this sense that at this moment in some countries, the crisis has opened up a more receptive space to talking about investment in care services and talking about care as part of the social infrastructure. And that's something I hope that we in the UK can build on uh, with a government that's not receptive to these ideas at the moment, but with other politicians that are receptive to these ideas. And from that point of view, I think for the project as a whole in policy terms, it's a, it's a kind of ending on both notes of concern and consternation of the ways in which the COVID has really revealed the, the cracks, the cracks in the systems of care delivery in so many countries, but also opened up new spaces. The, who are the likely policy entrepreneurs for this agenda was the last question, but I guess nobody had time to get around to answering that. But it may be there's a new space now where the policy entrepreneurs in the feminist economics community, the policy entrepreneurs in this network of people associated with this project, with the funders who are there, the policy entrepreneurs in think tanks and in organizations, trade unions representing care workers uh, and um, 
NGOs representing different groups of people who need care and want better care services. Maybe this is a time uh, when there's going to be more space. Yes, as Nancy says, we are the policy entrepreneurs. <laughs> I absolutely agree. Uh, and I think that's a good point for the project to, to be um, ending on this phase of it. And I hope that all the rich research that Beth um, alluded to in her PowerPoints can be distilled into short, snappy one pages, two pages that can really have an impact both in Korea, South Korea, and in the USA and in other countries on how this agenda is going to be taken forward. So congratulate everybody, all the research that they did. And I think it's, um, there are a lot of very, very interesting points about policy that are arising from it. So I think we have to bring this session to a close. So thank you everybody for participating. Thank you, Diane. Thank you, Diane. Thanks, uh, Beth and uh, all of our rapporteurs. Uh, next session, we will hear from uh, the funders of the Care Work and the Economy Project. We're very fortunate to have the support of both the William and Flora Hewitt Foundation and the Open Society Foundations. And we have uh, Marina Durano and Altea Anderson who will uh, be speaking from the perspective of the funders. So um, I will turn the floor over now to Marina Durano. Please, Marina. Hello, um, I'm checking if you can hear me correctly. Great, I switched to my phone. Um, okay, uh, congratulations. I mean, it, that's right, uh, that's where, uh, picking up from what Diane said, we should congratulate ourselves. That really needs to be said. Uh, Sergey and Beth, our principal investigators have pulled off quite a feat in, in bringing together more than 40 researchers to work on a clearly very complex question. Um, and Althea, I want to thank you and the Hewlett Foundation for your generosity in supporting this work and of the upcoming work uh, in Africa. We should actually take the time uh, to celebrate each other today, give each other a nod, a virtual hug. Uh, it's just excellent and, and exciting. So, uh, you know, like I'm hugging you as well. Um, now I have been involved in, in this project since its inception in 2016, when I first joined the Open Society Foundations. I was hired to develop a grant making portfolio that would promote economic justice for women. I interpreted that task as one focused on feminist economics, on feminist macroeconomics, and on building the care economy. So this project uh, is one of the several stars that make up a constellation of grantees in my portfolio. You know, and uh, uh, in, as a human rights foundation, OSF's priority will always be the social movement actors. You know, these are the feminists and, and the workers. Um, so let me set, take some time to name them so that you can recognize them um, as you do your work. Uh, the first is Equito Latino Americano para Justicia y Género, ELA, in Argentina. It is currently very much involved in drafting a new law to establish a federal integrated system of care. I want to also name the Women's Budget Group in the UK, whose partnership with the International Trade Union Confederation I credit for providing compelling arguments to invest in care. I actually credit them for successfully influencing the Biden administration, but they are too humble to take that. So, but I'm going to say it anyway. I continue to be inspired by the Global Union Federations. The International Domestic Workers Federation is on top of my list. Its deep leadership bench has the incredible capacity to sustain organizing under extremely challenging circumstances. And then there is the Uni Global Union that has recently been at the forefront of advocating for improvements in quality and in labor standards in the healthcare and long-term care industries, especially in this pandemic. Uni Global may not be familiar to you, but if you've heard of the Amazon organizing, this is the Global Union Federation that's been uh, in the midst of that. 
they are currently targeting portfolio investors in their advocacy work, uh, especially to remind them of their commitments to environmental, social, and governance standards you know, as um, invest and investment guidelines. Since the healthcare and long-term care industries are actually closely linked with the financial sector. So this financialization is actually particularly important. And they recently um, released a statement where 95 investor firms controlling more than 3 trillion assets signed and committed to better and higher standards uh, for those that are in their portfolio. So the idea here in combination is to, between yourselves, the work that you do, uh, and these, these unions and the feminist organizations, was to uh, create a kind of multiplier effect in the political arena through complementary action um, among yourselves. Um, and complementary action in multiple political arenas at that. So that, that's how I kind of designed uh, this, this grant making portfolio. And I especially appreciate this constellation of stars uh, at this particular mo moment in time. It's a political conjuncture that we are in that has the potential for shifting trajectories of entire societies, uh, almost revolutionary, if you will. The Argentinian government has led in this area despite debilitating debt burdens. Um, it's a very clear demonstration of what political will, what political will can actually deliver. And we see this in a way in the United States and Canada, announcing uh, investments in childcare and in the care in infrastructure. So in this conjuncture, the pandemic became a space to relate narratives on care and to witness care uh, firsthand and it is this witnessing, it is this listening to the narratives that is taking us to this tipping point. And the work presented in the past few days alongside the movement and organizing is pushing us along this particular trajectory. Even as our evidence and our analysis is not fully in place, you know, we have many questions. What we have done is to demonstrate possibilities. What used to be impossible is now feasible. Uh, and so I, that, that's really where we should give, um, we should congratulate ourselves for doing, you know, that, um, that, that we, we, we show that we can bake a pie, you know, that this pie is not some imagination. We show that it can, we can make it real. Uh, so I'm very glad that the University of Toronto will be leading uh, the next stage of this work. Now, as with any political conjuncture, things are in flux and there's plenty of uncertainty. The leadership of the Open Society Foundations has decided to significantly reduce its grant making in the care economy at the global level. The women's rights program as it is currently constituted will no longer exist by the end of this year. To be clear, all thematic programs will be shut down and a new global unit will be formed. Um, I'm disappointed. Uh, I had hoped that our accomplishments would inspire our leadership to sustain this work, but well, that is not the case. Uh, on the other hand, OSF's regional programs in Latin America and the Caribbean, in Europe and Eurasia, in Asia Pacific, and in the United States are committed to continuing this work. Our colleagues in Africa are looking to ensure that feminist economics is a priority in African knowledge production. For example, on top of our grants in Argentina, our Latin America program is currently supporting work by the city of Bogota and is now identifying other Latin American cities that may wish to establish similar integrated systems of care. Meanwhile, recent news of the CARE Fund you'll have seen in the papers has the Open Society United States as a partner to push forward the care economy work in this country. I'm not quite sure what our new organizational structure will look like, but there is a clearly stated commitment to intersectional gender justice as a pillar in the global work for open societies. I hope you don't see this change as bad news, but simply part of the shifts necessary to respond to the conjuncture we are in. Our leadership is concerned with developments in Myanmar, in Hong Kong, in Turkey and Hungary, as much as here in the United States that is fighting to preserve its own democratic structures. 
building care economies has moved forward in ways that we did not imagine back in 2016. I certainly did not imagine that we would be where we are now. New actors, especially funders, are moving in this direction. And after paving a path in the darkness, <laughs> demonstrating why and how private philanthropy should be investing in care economies, um, it seems time for us to, to look to the daybreak and, and start a new day. So thank you all for your contributions. Uh, I have learned a lot and, and hope to learn more. Uh, I will still be with you uh, in, in spirit, if not in financial terms. <laughs> so <laughs> there you go. Thank you so much, Marina. That was wonderful. Um, I think we have Altea Anderson next. Altea? Thanks. I want to make sure everyone can hear me okay. Yes. Great. On a phone and a computer as well. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I'm echoing Marina's congratulations to the entire care work and economy team and the feminist economics field um, for your longstanding commitment to seeding this current focus on the care economy. And many thanks to Sergi and Beth for inviting me to say a few words on behalf of the Hewlett Foundation. So at this point, it almost goes without saying that um, many intersecting factors, most notably the COVID pandemic, have finally brought the care economy to center stage amongst policymakers, donors, and most importantly, in the public imagination. As many have highlighted over the past year, the pandemic has brought into sharp relief the crisis in care in nations across the world that has health, economic, social implications, and equally important, highlights um, care as a primary sector in which gender inequalities are exacerbated. So care is being reframed as essential to economic recovery and job growth and as a basic human right. And as Diane and Rena mentioned earlier, in just the past month, we have seen significant examples of this reframing of how we think about care. Um, Dr. Fulbright is featured in a highly cited New York Times article about the culture shift and understanding care work as crucial to a functioning economy. And notably, the article appropriately credits feminist economists with driving home this message for decades. Canada announced a $30 billion in new spending over the next five years to create a national child care system. And the new U.S. American Jobs Plan includes $400 billion to expand, to expand um, public investment in home and community services for people with disabilities and older adults and to improve wages and working conditions um, for the care workforce. So there's a clear sea change and opportunities to seize this moment. Um, and it is with great pleasure that I've witnessed new donor um, investments building on this momentum. As Marina mentioned, in the past week, eight private philanthropies, including OSF under Marina's leadership, have announced a new $50 million care fund to support movement building for a universal publicly supported care infrastructure. And my understanding is that the first round of investments is focused domestically in the US with plans to expand globally um, over the next year. And it's important to acknowledge um, that attention to the care economy and private philanthropy, especially centering feminist economics, has been largely driven by my colleague Marina, who has made longstanding investments in this area. In fact, Hewlett's Women's Economic Empowerment grant making strategy that launched six years ago began with a focal area on the care economy based in part on our thought partnership with Marina. So much gratitude to you. Um, I have a limited amount of time, so I'd like to just share a few lessons um, my colleagues in our Women's Economic Empowerment Strategy and I have learned through our partnership um, with Sergi Beth and the Care Work and Economy Research Team. So the first lesson is the importance of valuing and investing in feminist-driven evidence generation and solutions for macroeconomic policymaking. The Care, Work, and Economy Project is an ex excellent example that the principles that guide economic analysis really matter. In this project, feminist principles so clearly inform the types of research questions that have been deemed worthy of consideration, the methods used, what was measured, how gender is considered in analysis, and the types of economic models and tools that were developed. And over the past year, we have seen other principally aligned calls to action for post-COVID economic recovery. 
As part of the current Global Generation Equality Forum, UN Women has launched a feminist plan for sustainability and social justice as a roadmap for putting gender equality at the center of post-COVID economic recovery. Last year, hundreds of African feminists, scholars, research, researchers, and activists came together to call on the African Union to recognize the economic, social, political, and cultural value of the care economy, highlighting that economic growth is subsidized by women's unpaid care and domestic and informal work, and the state's role in exacerbating women's inequitable care burden. They've put forth a call of action to national governments to adopt macroeconomic policies and invest in social protections that recognize the centrality of care work for health and social systems and the economy. The second lesson is the importance of funding research in a way that integrates the principles of partnership and inclusive decision making. Without question, the Care Work and Economy Project is conceptually and methodologically very rigorous. In addition, its added value is how the research was co-creatively designed across a global team and shared with the field through these annual meetings, which have served as field strengthening spaces. The sharing and learning approach allowed for strategic collaboration among scholars working on the care economy and the Hewlett Foundation's recent investment in the Care Work and Economy Africa partnership as a result of this inclusive convening space. And the last lesson is the importance of beginning this type of research with potential use cases and pathways to engage evidence users clearly in sight. So the Care Work and Economy Project in many ways um, has set a standard in my own grant making of what stakeholder engagement should look like with policy entrepreneurs outside the field of feminist um, e economics. Since the beginning of the project, the team engaged the Korean government on how it might incorporate the research findings on gender and care work in economic policy planning. The team also actively engaged women's organizations, care workers, migrant workers, and human rights groups in Korea to better understand the challenges faced by both paid and unpaid caregivers and discuss necessary policy changes which inform the analysis, the research products, and policy recommendations. So these lessons have been extremely informative in my research and advocacy grant making, not just in women's economic empowerment, but also international reproductive health. Um, what I share with peer funders as private philanthropy has a limited but really important role in contributing to a reimagined just and equitable care economy. And I thank Sergi, Beth, and the Care Work and Economy team for consistently drawing attention to the importance of how this research can inform gender-aware macroeconomic policy in Korea, in Korea and globally. And equally important, how the research was conducted through the frame of feminist economics and equitable partnership, which I believe strengthened the quality of the evidence that has been produced and the extent to which um, the evidence is valued by different users. So I just end with deep gratitude for this partnership. Thank you so much, Altea and Marina for, for your support, your encouragement and your leadership um, and your remarks today. Uh, I think we have about two minutes for any comments or questions before we start our next session. So we'll open up the floor for the next two minutes. Beth, go ahead. I think you had your hand yes, up. A question for Marina, because she was signaling to us a, a transformation of uh, OSF. So where is, so I think you signaled that most of the care work is gonna be in the regional projects. So what's left in the on the global side for care and for gender? Fair question, fair question. Um, <clears throat> we, uh, our director, I mean, to be very <laughs> technocrat about it, our director will be meeting with our leadership uh, next week. You know, so we will actually get a better sense of that. To my understanding, there's a lot of interest on feminist economics 
uh, uh, just just broadly for the whole organization, including uh, leadership. You know, uh, it's the specific question of of of, of the care economy that emphasis um, that will be uh, pulled back. You know, so I think it may actually be wider, uh, potentially because we are interested in climate justice, potentially to link to um, the work on uh, authoritarianism uh, and so on. So it it it's going to be like a, it's it'll change in characteristic, but we cannot pursue gender justice without dealing with care economy. So if they are serious about gender justice, we have no choice but to actually work on this. Uh, so in that sense, uh, I feel that it will still continue. Uh, it will just look a little bit different, you know? Um, and the way I outlined the partners uh, to you will not be any more the constellation as I, because you're all stars to me, you know, you're all stars to me. So it will no longer be that constellation. Maybe we're moving from Aries to Taurus. I, I don't know, <laughs> but we will figure that out, you know, over the next uh, year, over the next six months uh, into the year. So I hope that that satisfies, but I cannot give any more detail beyond that. Um, and so we will make, we will be responsible grant makers. You know, uh, be, if you, we have insisting partnerships right now, we will be responsible. We will not like drop you like a hot potato. That is not how we will operate. Uh, so, so, and we, I will have conversations with each of you as soon as I have more information. I hope that's okay. Thank you, Marina. All right, so uh, let's start our final session of the final day of our annual meeting. And uh, this session will focus on what's next, uh, new research on care and the economy. And this will be chaired by Beth King and uh, panelists include Ito Peng, Isabella Abudarin, Ana Maria Tribbin, and Maria Floro. So Beth. Hello again. So this is the last session for our annual meeting. And so it's appropriate to, uh, to look forward. We, sp we were looking backwards and, 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 uh, and consolidating, consolidating the insights from the project. But as we know, the care agenda is not complete. And we discussed during the breakout sessions so many things that need to be done. On the research side, as well as the advocacy side, we'd like to hear now from what are the plan uh, of uh, Ito, Isabella, and Anna have received funding from our generous um, foundations. So let's hear from what are the specifics of the next projects. So may uh, I'd like to give the floor first to Ito. Sure, thank you very much, Beth. Um, so in, in terms of the next step of this project, uh, I think Marina has kind of hinted, uh, uh, mentioned already in her uh, talk earlier, um, that, that we, will, we are planning to scale up and extend um, our care economy uh, research uh, to, to more global and comparative level. Uh, so, um, and, and in fact, already many of, many of you in this meeting have been involved in this. Um, we have been working uh, together for the last couple of years uh, on the next phase of the care economy, a uh, care work and economy project uh, by finding ways to adapt and, and innovate on the kind of research that we did in South Korea to other countries. And so as the, as the discussions yesterday pointed out, um, it will be really important and, inter uh, and interesting uh, to do this, uh, to extend this research to uh, more uh, sort of lower middle and higher income countries are uh, taking into consideration uh, different, social, different social, economic, uh, cultural, and normative uh, contexts. So in the 
forthcoming research project, which has been really generously funded by a number of funders, including uh, the Hilda Foundation, Open Society Foundation, uh, SHRC, the uh, Social Science and Humanities Research Council, and, and others. Uh, I'll mention a little bit more about this later. Um, uh, uh, we will be looking at the care economies in context uh, and, and in which we'll be uh, adapting and innovating um, our current projects, uh, research methods uh, to eight different countries in four global regions. Uh, they are two in Africa, uh, Kenya and Senegal, uh, two in Latin America, Colombia and Costa Rica, um, two in Asia, Sri Lanka, Mongol and Mongolia, and two OECD countries, uh, which are Canada and Italy. Um, we were hoping to use similar method, research methods that we employed in the South Korean studies um, in, in in addition to um, so in addition to undertaking the literature and policy review of care care work and care related policies in these countries we are also hoping to conduct two large questionnaire surveys including time use surveys of the care workers and surveys of household caregiving and care receiving and a large uh, in-depth interview surveys of caregiving and care receiving uh, so with the purpose to find uh, to get more sense of uh, care context and infrastructures in these countries. We then uh, plan to use these empirical data uh, to develop macroeconomic models. Uh, I'm hoping that this new research project will have a, uh, will have a number of policy and research impacts. Uh, first, uh, I think um, uh, this new New research will enable us to uh, collect more up-to-date, uh, more nuanced, and more finer-grained data uh, about care, care work, uh, family, and gender dynamics, and the impact of the COVID-19 on the care economy. Uh, it will then also allow us to analyze the nature and mechanisms of the care economy and their interactions with policy institutions and cultures and, and at the both national glo and global le level and as well in a comparative perspectives. Um, secondly, I think uh, this new research will also allow us to contribute to uh, various national global policy dialogues um, and policy developments in country, uh, in various other countries uh, involved. Uh, for example, uh, in Canada already, uh, where the national government has already made it clear their commitments to the care economy, uh, largely because of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, we are already talking to the governments uh, about the data collection and policy options. Uh, I know that governments in other countries, such as Colombia, Mongolia, and others are also interested in understanding and developing better policies in this area. Also, uh, I hope that this research will uh, help inform, support, and energize and contribute to the uh, civil society actors and other key care actors in, the, in, in their policy community development and mobilization activities. And then finally, I hope that this new research will bring together um, different care economy actors at uh, that ranging from local to global levels to work together and continue to uh, continue uh, our care economy agenda. Um, I should also mention that uh, so, uh, th there are a number of people and institutions involved in this pr project. Um, first, I, I want to really uh, mention that this project has already received fundings uh, from Social Science and Humanities Research Council of Canada uh, through the Partnership Research Grant and the University of Toronto for uh, providing kind of overall project and um, uh, project funding and, and, and student training support. We also have received really generous uh, fundings from the Hewlett Foundation uh, for the African po portion of the project 
and the Open Society Foundation uh, for the feasibility studies and other uh, continuing uh, support. Uh, I know that Open Society Foundation has also funded several other projects uh, separately, uh, sort of in Colombia uh, and of course uh, for South Korea. Uh, we have just submitted uh, also, uh, we have been actually invited to submit an expression of interest uh, for a new funding uh, from the IDRC in Canada. Uh, so um, I just want to mention that we've been really, we've been really fortunate to receive uh, a lot of um, sort of support and 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 fundings from our institutional partners. Um, um, in a little bit more detail, we have uh, research teams uh, in eight in the eight countries that we're studying uh, that are led or co-led by one or two research leads. Many of them are here in this meeting. Um, I would not name every one of them because that would take long, uh, but, um, but simply to say that uh, many of you in, uh, have been part of this new project and we will be working together. I'm so, I'm so glad uh, uh, for the next several years. Uh, we also have important national and global inter uh, institutions who are partnering with us in this project. And this includes UN Women, UNRISD, ILO, uh, and various national statistical agencies such as Statistics Canada, and various uh, national central banks, uh, and as well Levy Institute. Uh, and other universities and research uh, think tanks. Uh, in Canada, uh, the, the, gov um, uh, the, the Canadian government and NGO partners uh, also includes uh, IDRC, uh, Women and Gender Equality Canada, Canadian Labour Congress, uh, Child Care Resource Centres, and several other NGO uh, groups. So, and, and, and so these uh, uh, partners and, 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 and uh, uh, co-investigators, uh, co um, they will have very diverse roles in this project, uh, including providing us uh, with not just funding and in-kind support, but also advising us, uh, providing governance for our project. Um, some of these institutions are also helping us with research design, uh, data collection and analysis, and information sharing, training, and knowledge mobilization and communication. Uh, so we'll be working very closely um, with uh, not only uh, the co-investigators co and collaborators, but also with the uh, partner agencies uh, in local, national and global level. So I just wanted to say I'm really excited. Uh, I think uh, we are heading to a, a really exciting project. And I totally agree with both Althea and Marina that, that this is a moment. And I think in which COVID has opened that 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 political, social, and economic openings, but it's a narrow co corridor. So we really have to move forward quickly um, before that corridor sub door closes on that. Uh, so again, um, this is just update on what's coming next. Thanks. Thank you very much, Ito. Just listening to you, that's huge. <laughs> that's a huge agenda and how many, many, many parts you will have to be coordinating, consolidating, that's, you're very brave. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I will continue to need all your help. So, so I'm saying thank you in advance for your help and support. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ita. And so then uh, we will be hearing from um, Isabella Abaderin about the Africa uh, part of this pro new project. Isabella, please. Um, thank you very much, Beth. And uh, it's really nice to see so many of you again, albeit on screen. But I hope we'll have a chance to visit in person again soon. So thank you very much. So, yes. Um, you've already alluded to it and Ito has touched on it. We have been able to, if you like, take the core of the Quigam project and its idea and build on that to fashion what will be a program of care, of 
research and policy engagement uh, on care systems and economies in Africa that very much speaks to the particular realities, contexts, policy debates and opportunities in the continent. And before I go on to describe some of the details of that, I just wanted to express my gratitude, first of all, to Sergi and the Quigam team um, for bringing us into your discussions so generously um, in Berlin first and then in Glasgow. And without that engagement, without the connections forged, I don't think we would be here today. We wouldn't be talking about this project. And secondly, of course, gratitude to Althea and the Hewlett Foundation for, um, for making this possible and agreeing to fund our project. So I spoke about the fact that we've built on the Quigam project to really fashion it in ways that speak most to what we think are African realities and challenges around care, particular ones for the continent. So the first um, decision we made was to focus the project specifically on two elements of care, care at both ends of the life course and intergenerational dynamics across those. So care, early child care, as well as long-term care for older adults who are no longer able to live independently without the help of others. Um, we also decided to make this explicitly a two country project focused on Kenya and on Senegal but with an explicitly regional focus, which means that we will um, explicitly engage constituencies, both research and advocacy and policy constituencies that act at the continental levels as well as the sub-regional levels. We think this is very important to go beyond the national level. And secondly, you've already alluded to it, um, I guess the same applies across the world. We feel that within the context of COVID, we might be at a critical juncture where the status quo as regards those two elements of care, you know, is really seen increasingly as no longer being tenable. The gaps in the systems being laid bare by the pandemic. And as a result, we really have a sense from discussions with our policy partners that a space is opening up, not only for thinking about and envisioning policy change on care, you know, as part of the broader debate around how to reset and reorient Africa's social economic systems, but perhaps even a space um, for galvanizing action in the right direction. And so I would say that our project really is oriented towards informing, hopefully, and galvanizing policy change. And the three things that we want to aim um, to accomplish in that regard is first to generate incisive and Africa-centered knowledge. That's very important. Africa-centered knowledge that clarifies the case and the directions for policy and investment to expand early child care and long-term care provisioning and infrastructures. But we want to go beyond that. So we want to go beyond generating that body of evidence to really foster the consideration, the understanding, the embrace and the use of the knowledge that we're generating by key regional and national policy and decision makers and other political actors. And for that, we're going to work actively to bring together and engage advocacy coalitions around this issue of care. And then lastly, and this is also very important in context of ITO's global project, if you like, is that we want to embed Africa as the locus of generating knowledge on care in the continent. So advance a flourishing African scientific endeavor on care that can not only sustain policy change in the longer term, but also advance and really, I think, open up global debates in the field, including theoretical and conceptual debates around care. Um, I won't go into the work packages, Beth, um, unless you want me to, but I'm conscious of time. Maybe just to say that we, what's also important about this project, that this is an African-led consortium. So um, the African Population and Health Research Center is the lead. Um, other, part, other partners in the consortium are the Regional Center of Excellence in the Generational Economies, 
I'm not sure if Latif is here, but you will have met Latif. Um, then there is the University of Bristol Periboli Africa Research Center. That's my center. The University of Toronto, obviously Ito um, has spoken um, as well as, and this again is very important, um, the Maui AfriFem Macroeconomics Collective, as well as the Institute for Economic Justice, which really will inform all areas of the project. And so we feel we have a really, not just an excellent consortium, um, but a really excellent basis as far as the context is concerned to make this project, a pro um, I think the, the success it deserves to be. So um, Beth, if you want thank more you. detail, I'm very happy to share. Yeah, thank you very much, Isabella. And, and I think we might have a few minutes for questions later. So if people have other questions. So the third uh, star in this constellation of the next care um, and economy project is uh, Anna Tribin, Anna Maria Tribin, who will talk to us about the plans for Colombia. Anna. Hi, Beth. Hi, how are you? Thank you very much for inviting me to this amazing um, seminar because it has been very interesting. So uh, with Natalia Ramirez, Paula Herrera and me, we have been working in adapting the care economy project from South Korea into Colombia. Uh, Maria Flor inspired us to start uh, this project. And with the generosity of uh, Open Society, we have been working in this for several months and we're very happy with the results we have been seeing. Um, our idea is to land research in such a way that it talks with advocates and policymakers. We have a, now our project name is Quanta. We have a web page where we provide the public with qualitative and quantitative tools so people can empower themselves with all these tools to promote gender equality. We have been seeing that there's a space right now for this. We are very happy with this project because uh, policymakers uh, in Colombia right now, we have a huge uh, problem with gender. The, the gap between men and women have been uh, going, uh, is, 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 is huge right now. We have uh, unemployment of 18% for women. That's very high. And for men, it's 10%. So we have to do something about women. And, there, and, and also, uh, women are not participating in the labor market. Uh, now, the participation rate is uh, about 47, 48%. So most of women are not participating. Uh, the, a majority of women are not participating, even though that in Colombia, women are uh, have more education than men. So that is completely ineffective, no? So the policymakers are worried with the situation and we have been talking with them and providing with a lot of tools. For example, we are uh, studying the, the use of time during COVID, we are caref caref carefully monitoring paid care and domestic work during the pandemic. Uh, we have also uh, been um, interviewing women to know how they are dealing with all these tasks at the same time. Um, and we have several reports, papers. We have been doing these workshops uh, providing people with the files in order for them to download all the data from the National uh, Statistics Department so they can work with the data and find out all the gaps using our do files. So this has been in very, I think we have a strong voice right now uh, and we have a, a, a space that need, was, need, was important to fill and and we are doing that. Uh, also, uh, for example, uh, last time the, uh, the mayor of Bogota was talking about uh, proposals for, um, for, for encouraging women to join the 
labor market, and she used our reports in her presentation because no one was doing that. So we are doing that. And she obviously invited us because she needed a help to think about what to do. So we are a, encouraging a policymakers to start using our tools and also a, having this conversation and, and making this um, a topic in, relevant for a city or for a country uh, that that wasn't thinking about this topic uh, before. Also, we have been talking with the central government, the national uh, development department uh, called us and they want to use all our tools. They uh, are uh, looking forward to use the macroeconomic model because when they are doing all these policies, uh, they want to show people how this uh, change men and women life because now people are aware of this problem for women and they always show everything for the general population. So I think with our tools, they can show that it's important to, to invest in care and also all the things that they are doing, how it uh, affects differentially men and women. <laughs> Thank you very much, Anna. Thank you very much. So I'm sure there are many more things to share with people. So I'm opening, let's give a few minutes for questions and answers, yeah? So, so let's see, um, we are supposed to end at 10, but I've just gotten the go signal from uh, Shireen that we can go a few minutes over just because there will be questions for the next step for Ito, for Isabella, and for Ana Maria. And then we will hear a few last words from Sergi. So any questions at this point? Um, Althea, is that you want to ask a question? Also, a Sorry, who are the who are the people who want to ask questions? Sounds like Louisa. Louisa. Hi. Louisa. So Althea, did you want to ask a question a question too? No, is my hand raised somewhere? Oh, it's because you were not muted, so I thought you would. Oh, it's but, it's it's yeah, just how I'm connected. Louisa, Sorry. Yeah. So Louisa, go ahead. Thank you so much. This has been extremely interesting and helpful too to hear. My question is uh, for Ana Maria. Uh, I'm from Brazil and I've been thinking a lot about uh, this in the context of Brazil and a lot of the work that is done in other regions did not really help me think uh, of the specific problems uh, of Brazil and I think Colombia is uh, closer structurally and uh, in many senses. So I was just wondering, uh, you said you, you've been using the work that has been done in Korea on your own work for Colombia. I was wondering what are the, the main differences you found? What are the things that you're having to do novel research on and adapt uh, to the context of Latin America or specifically Colombia? And Excellent. congratulations, well, it's really interesting the work you're doing. Thank you so much. Excellent question. But uh, let, let me gather before, Anna Maria, be, before answering that question, uh, let me just see if there are other questions on the floor because we don't have a whole lot of time. I just wanna, um, can you, uh, if you have a question, you wanna speak up? Because I don't see everybody. Okay, all right, Ana Maria. Okay, uh, well, uh, there are a lot of difference. For example, we have uh, a, a, one of our big problems is that uh, the informality. So we have a different um, labor market setting, no? So we have to understand that there's a huge part of the labor market that is in the informality and those dynamics are different. Some, sometimes uh, some of the, for example, if you think about uh, a maternity leave, that is just for 
the formal sector. So if you start to advocate for maternity leave, you end up advocating for a small uh, portion of women, no? Uh, but, uh, and, and also um, in South Korea, they are aging. And, and in, in Colombia, we still have a, a lot of issues with topics related with children. If you see at the data, um, the, for example, we made this exercise looking the probability of being informal. And for women, the probability of being informal increases with children, but not increases when you have uh, people over 65 years old. Because if you look at the time use data, a lot of the people that are over 65 years old, they are caring. So they are helping uh, you, or like uh, they're helping the mothers to go out and work. So they are very different di dynamics. And therefore it's important for us in the model to others that we have informality, for example, um, uh, we also need uh, all this uh, with macroeconomic analysis and also qualitative analysis of what is different because we have to be aware that it's an adaptation is not just copy paste. So, so that's the, 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 the different things that you have. I also, uh, I, I wanted to mention one thing is that uh, Colombia and Latin America is the only place that uh, has uh, the survey of use of time that was done during the pandemic. So we now have information about the effects of the pandemic in the use of time. And we are, we have uh, all this data and we are processing all the data to show people how uh, the, um, the pandemic impact women in Colombia and how this is related with the results that we see in the labor market. Just to just to mention something that we have been seeing is that uh, for passive uh, care, women double the time. So they are doing a day five more hours, while men are doing only 40 minutes more a day. So that that is that is outstanding. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ana Maria. Um, Luisa, I hope she had uh, responded to your question, and I'm sure the two of you can get together uh, more directly to, to to learn more about what's going on. I just want to ask one oh, sorry, question. Sorry, could I could I just um, oh. add to yeah? Sorry, I, could I just add to what Anna Maria had said uh, because uh, we had a chance to meet and talk about sort of the, the adaptation uh, just before the COVID-19. And one of the things that really surprised me in terms of the difference uh, between Colombia and South uh, Korea was Anna Maria mentioning to us so, sort of in addition to the, the kind of difference that she mentioned, also the, the amount of rural to urban migration and as well, Colombia now houses something close to 2 million Venezuelan refugees. Uh, so you've got, in addition to that, the migration uh, sort of component uh, that needs to be taken into context um, and, and the, the, the very different regional and ethnic diversity uh, within Colombian uh, populations. So I, I think Ana Maria could explain some more. <laughs> I think that's key and I didn't mention that. We have this inflow of uh, Venezuelan migration that it was in a short time uh, of 2 million people from 2016 to 2019. Um, and we are also studying this because it's important to study in our project. So we are thinking about this care chain and we have seen different things that what is found in the United States. In the United States, you see that with the migration, uh, uh, women with high education are participating more. You don't see this in Colombia. The early things that we have been seeing is that uh, because 
there, there was already enough uh, offer of domestic work. Um, woman, th there's no change for women with, uh, with a high uh, education. You, you see change in women with low education. They start to participate more. Um, so, so I think this is key, uh, and, and I also forgot to mention that also that we are a, a, with ITO in this effort to globally a, make people aware of care economy that I think is amazing. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Anna Maria. Ito, I just wanted to ask, when are you are you planning a launching a launch meeting? You and, and Isabella and Anna Maria for the next project. That's the last question that we have time for. Thank you. Yes, we are planning to do the launch meeting. We just found out that we received a SHIRC uh, partnership uh, research grant uh, last month. Uh, we had initially th thought ab about, well, this was you know, well before the COVID, we were thinking uh, we will have in-person, like bring people together to Toronto, but I think uh, that's not going to be possible. Um, so uh, we might have some kind of hybrid um, meeting um, we, uh, sometime either toward the end of this summer or early, um, uh, early fall. Um, we are still working to put together the administrative teams, uh, uh, even though we have a lot of students sort of really eager to, to, to start. Um, I, we need to just put together the ad administrative team first. Yeah, so we will, yes. And so you get invites. <laughs> <laughs> so we will wait for that. Um, congratulations again to, uh, to the three of you for, 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 for making sure that we have a, a, an important effort to continue this work on uh, the care economy. And good luck, Ito, Isabella, and Ana Maria. So for, as, the, as our last um, speakers, we, we're going to hear a few remarks, closing remarks from Sergi. Sergi, the floor is yours. Thank you, Beth. Uh, first of all, listening to our previous speakers, I recall a few years ago at the first annual meeting, as Isabella mentioned, of this project held in October 2018 in Berlin. There were two fascinating presentation, presentations made by Anna Maria Trebin and Isabella Abaturin. Both made a strong case that a research project on care work the economy and homegrown development should expand in Colombia and the Africa region. Ana Maria argued that Colombia is a middle income country where it is imperative to start working on the issue of care economy. Isabella set out the rationale for adaptation of the care work and the economy project in sub-Saharan Africa. She argued that the project's theory of change poses that gender sensitive care policies will propel a set of transformative outcomes in the region. Then in June 2019, Ito, Beth and I had a series of brainstorming sessions during the Gender Care and Migration Conference held in the University of Toronto. We explored ways on how to better understand the organization of care economies in varying contexts. And born of that informal discussion is this one um, initiative uh, led by Ito Peng on the care economies in context. Along with other researchers and regional and national policy and NGO partners, all three of them worked very hard to make this vi their vision a reality. The road towards our common goals is still long. Through this, initiatives, I see this community expanding, bringing in more scholars and advocacy groups and partners from the South and the North in these adaptations of the care work and the economy project. Because the ways that we envision and provide care will have immense consequences 
in achieving and also implications for attainment of economic and social justice, gender equality, and sustainable development. I believe that these initiatives and more to come will ensure that access to the highest quality of research and to assure that the findings of their research reach the audience that is most able to use them to bring about change. Finally, I want to say some word of thanks um, to the people who work behind the scenes, who made this project possible. I thank the funders earlier, as well as the researchers and other people involved, but I want to acknowledge in particular the American University Program on Gender Analysis and Economics, where this project is based, and the work of our wonderful communications team and RAs, uh, Beth, Shireen, Arslan, whom you know very well already through your communications with her, Jennifer Brown, um, Glenn Quendy, Catherine Hensley, Catherine Palby, Anna Herrera, Pravina Bandera, Hannah Randolph, and other RAs whose work in disseminating and overseeing the logistics and technical aspects of this annual meeting, and as well as the communication and dissemination strategies have been invaluable. I want to thank you all for coming and joining us in this final Care Work in the Economy annual meeting. For the excellent presentations and valuable input and insights that you have shared in the discussions. It has been a wonderful journey and we will continue moving on forward together in different ways. Uh, but I think this, pro, uh, this meeting has gave us many food for thought, a lot of innovative ideas and suggestions for future initiatives, as well as some deep questions to ponder. We will send in a week or so the summary highlights of the annual meeting as well as the web links to the video recording of the three days of uh, the meeting. I hope to see you virtually in a couple of weeks at the forthcoming Center for Transnational Migration and Social Inclusion, as well and, and uh, together with the Care Work and the Economy Project, who will be hosting the Policy Dialogue Conference in June 1 to 4, 1 to 3, um, um, East Coast time and two to four Korean time. Have a wonderful summer. Summer. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, I think that wraps up our session for today and our annual meeting. A uh, huge round of applause for all of our speakers, presenters, yeah. chairs. Thank you all so much for uh, the last three days and have a wonderful weekend. Yeah.